Thank you for all that. And uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of this meeting for having me here today. Very special thanks to Professor Morazic, who's always such a wonderful host, and to the kind people of, of Kyoto. This has been a great, great experience. Um, well, I'm going to be talking about a notion of evolution, which is a little bit different than what we've been uh, hearing in the past few uh, days, past couple of days. I'm going to talk about the evolution of a quantum mechanical view of the interaction of light and matter. In doing so, I'm going to show you some calculations I did uh, in collaboration with the people at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And in particular, I'm going to mention the calculations of the student, Shungo Miyabi, who is a Japanese student at UC Davis currently. So uh, Shungo did a good part of these calculations. So, well, we all know that Charles Darwin's original postulate states that each species of life descended from a primordial form through the process he called the natural selection. Now, in science, we could also think of ideas evolving over, uh, over time to give birth to new scientific theories. So what you see here is a list of some of the theories that became extinct. There's a long list, I just selected a few. So the Earth as the center of the universe is a theory that became extinct, and that extinction was as radical as the extinction of the dinosaurs, and a whole uh, set of philosophical and religious ideas collapsed with it. Another example is the theory of luminiferous ether, and uh, that was supposed to be a medium in which light needed to, needed to be to propagate in, and we all now know that that is not necessary. Like, uh, does not need a uh, medium to propagate in. And there are many earlier uh, models of the atom that also uh, became superseded. The plum pudding model is just one example of them. But uh, earlier uh, today, or yesterday, I believe, uh, Professor uh, Fushimura mentioned that, well, the goal of evolution is not to deliver uh, a, a complete animal, a, a perfect species. And, and certainly, there are no correct animals. These theories were superseded because they were wrong. They were all going to be wrong. But does evolution uh, have an end? Uh, well, evolution, animal and plant evolution, does not have as an end to deliver a, perfectly, a perfect animal. And perhaps in science we do have that goal to reaching that complete and perfect theory. So there will, uh, I will come back to this question towards the end of this talk. But for now, I'm going to give uh, the people that are not uh, a better, a different backgrounds, a little bit, of, uh, a few notions about quantum mechanics that will help you uh, understand the rest of this talk. Uh, the emergence of quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics uh, emerged as a need to describe the world at a very small scale. Uh, for everyday phenomena, we're perfectly well off with the uh, classical physics laws. We have laws of motion and laws of uh, electrodynamics, Maxwell's equations. We do perfectly well with those. However, when we look at nature at a very small scale, it behaves very, very differently. Very strange things happen. For instance, uh, waves be behave like particles, and particles can behave as waves, right? And that's what we call the wave particle duality. What you see here is a picture that uh, represents the diffraction of X rays, which are definitely waves. Uh, going when they go by uh, metal foil. So that's a diffraction pattern that these make. And if instead of making uh, x-rays go through that metal foil, we have electrons, which are particles, go through that metal foil, we will have a diffraction pattern that looks almost identical. So that's just one example. And we have other examples in quantum mechanics. Another characteristic is that energy is quantized. So energy can only be um, thought of as a discrete packets, right? So for instance, uh, what you see here are different levels of um, energy levels for the hydrogen atom. And so each horizontal line represents a different energy level. And what this means is that an electron is only allowed to live on any one of these dis discrete levels. It cannot live anywhere in between. And then uh, emission and, and absorption of light will have to do with transitions between these two levels. Another characteristic of quantum mechanics is that we can only predict probabilities of finding systems in a particular state, right? So we cannot predict the outcome of an experiment with certainty anymore. So uh, here are some probability amplitudes of stationary states of hydrogen. They could be, they could have different signs over space. They could be positive, negative, and that's what the blue and, and uh, red represent. But what I'd like to point out is the symmetry if they have. 
uh, they could be right to left symmetry, up and down symmetry, but um, they're not necessarily all spherical sym symmetric, but uh, that's typical of quantum mechanics. And the solution of any system that has uh, any symmetry to it will, um, will expose that symmetry and underlying symmetries to form a group of symmetries. Now, this group of symmetries will characterize that particular system. How about molecules? Well, I just showed you a few orbitals of uh, these mathematical functions that describe the wave-like behavior of electrons in atoms. Well, we could use them to construct uh, molecules as well. So we can take these atomic orbitals, combine them by either uh, adding them or subtracting them to form molecular orbitals, right? And these two have symmetries. It could be even a rod of the reflection through the middle of the molecule, but there's symmetry involved in molecular orbitals as well. How about light? Light is also quantized in quantum mechanics, and so we can think of light as um, being made out of um, particles of light, right? It's very special particles. I'm sweeping many details under the rug here because they're massless particles, but uh, they're characterized by their energy. Those particles are called photons, and this is a graphical representation. And I circled here X-ray photons, uh, and you can see how uh, the larger the frequency, the more energetic they are. So we're going to, I'm going to talk about X-ray photons interaction with matter, and that's why I circled that thing. So here we have the interaction of, a, of an X-ray photon with, say, a, a, an atom here. This is a very basic representation of an atom. When an X-ray photon interacts with this, this high-energy photon will rip out one of the core electrons, one of the electrons that is tightly bound close to the nucleus. It will rip that out, and uh, what will happen is that it will create a hole there, right? So there's going to be a hole there. An electron from an outer shell will come and fill in that hole. And what's going to happen then is that either another X-ray photon is emitted, or uh, yet um, another electron from the outer shell gets kicked out. So there's going to be two electrons leaving. That's what happens most frequently. The important thing about this is that there is so much energy to, to be gained by that transition that this is going to be this is going to happen very, very fast. And quickness is a key point here for what I'm going to tell you. If this turns out to be a molecule instead of an atom, then we, we will be left with two positive charges, and what's going to happen is that molecule is going to be uh, will have too few electrons to keep together, so it's going to dissociate. All right, symmetry. Uh, yesterday, uh, Dr. Cho mentioned how important symmetry was in brain processes. Well, let me tell you, in atomic and molecular physics, symmetry is extremely important as well. So, uh, let's, let's look at this, this, this molecule here. It represents a molecule of water, right? Oxygen and two hydrogens. What is symmetry? Symmetry is any operation, any geometrical operation I can do on this system such that it will leave it unchanged. For instance, if I look away, and while I'm looking at you, somebody comes here and makes this spin 180 degrees around this axis here. When I look back, I won't be able to tell any difference. And that's because of the um, indistinguishability of these two hydrogen atoms here, right? So um, why is this so important? Well, because symmetry in molecules and atoms establish what are called selection rules. And those selection rules will allow us to predict the outcome of experiments. And uh, also, um, these, these selection rules will help us interpret, understand spectral lines, which would otherwise be a forest of lines. We can understand what that means, knowing the symmetry that these molecules have. And it is so important that um, over the last 60 years or so, we've been teaching our students uh, symmetry and spectroscopy based on uh, spectroscopy, atomic and molecular physics based on symmetry. So no matter whether you're a student at Berkeley or you're a student in Moscow, uh, you uh, are likely to find books, textbooks that look like this. Okay, now I'm ready to tell you the story I came to tell you. The story about symmetry and quickness. What you see here is a device uh, which uses a method called the Coltrane's method. It's a very particular device because it allows us to catch the fragments of a dissociation in coincidence. So these are detectors that are both time and position sensitive, and we have electric and magnetic fields placed parallel to each other, and what will happen is that the positive 
of fragments of a dissociation of a fragmentation will go towards this blue plate, whereas the electrons are going to drift over to the red plate. And um, because we know the equations that govern these trajectories, we can find out, we can figure out the position that the molecule was at when these two electrons left the molecule, right? And so we can map the uh, angular distribution of these electrons in the body frame of a molecule with respect to the molecular axis, right? Um, so let me tell you what happened with CO2, with carbon dioxide. Well, this is a very symmetric molecule. As you can see, it's linear, it's planar. And when we uh, hit this molecule with an X-ray photon, what's going to happen is that that X-ray photon is going to rip out an electron from this carbon. Uh, uh, one of those inner electrons, those core electrons, is going to get ripped out. That's what we call photoionization, right? But what happens next is what is called the O'Shea de decay, right? This hole is produced. That's that electron that left, the photoelectron. This hole is produced, so an electron from an outer shell is going to come down to fill that hole. That's called the O'Shea decay, and, and what happens, there's so much energy in this that it kicks out this partner, so that one leaves too. That's, a, that's, the, photo, uh, that's the O'Shea electron leaving the system there. Now the molecule is left with two positive charges, and it's going to break apart, it's going to dissociate. So an OC, a carbon monoxide fragment, positively charged is going to go on one, in one direction, and the oxygen positively charged is going to go in the other direction. So what was the puzzle here? Well, we constructed that map, we used Coltrane's that apparatus I showed you, and constructed this map. This, uh, this um, device measures, does this measurement for one molecule at a time, for millions of molecules over several hours, and we can construct these, these red dots Right? And what happened is that when we picked the molecules that had the CO going to the left, we realized we found that the, that the distribution, the angular distribution, the photoelectron was going to the right. And that was completely mind-blowing. We expected a symmetric pattern. If you remember, this, photo uh, this photoelectron is the very first electron that leaves. It's when the molecule is, how, how does it know? How does it know beforehand where this fragment is going to go? So that was completely puzzling because it left from a perfectly symmetric situation and, um, and it knows. So we've got asymmetric patterns there. Okay, let me tell you what happened. We were so puzzled, we went off to do calculations to try and understand and interpret what was happening here. So this is what we found. Of course, molecules are not still in space. Molecules vibrate, right? One of the three uh, vibration, normal vibrational modes of, of carbon dioxide is this asymmetric stretch, and I'll expand, expand a little bit about this later. So what we found is that if we did calculations when these two, when, when this bond was compressed here to the left, and this one was stretched out a little bit to the right, we found patterns that described what we were seeing experimentally, right? So we, figured, we, found, we realized that the first electron, that photoelectron, knew and remembered where the atoms were at the moment it left the molecule, right? Now, <clears throat> what happened next is O'Shea decay occurred, right? That uh, outer shell electron came down, fill in that, to fill in that vacancy, right? And that happened within fe six femtoseconds. Of course, to put that time uh, scale into perspective, it takes about 14.2 femtoseconds for this molecule to vibrate, right? So this happens in a fraction of the time it takes the molecule to vibrate fully. And so, O'Shea decay, the O'Shea decay was actually the ultra-fast probe, and that's what we discovered. So, let me tell you a little bit more about detail, a little more detail about how this happened, okay? so. Carbon dioxide has three no normal modes of vibration. The normal modes of, of vibration are as follows. If my head were the uh, carbon and my fists were the oxygen, the symmetric stretch mode would be something like this. The asymmetric stretch mode, the second vibrational mode there, would be something like this. And the bending mode is... So those are the three modes of vibration, right? But the fact that this molecule vibrates does not necessarily mean that the, 
symmetry should be broken. Because if you think about it, if you give it enough time, what's going to happen is that the molecule is going to spend as much time in that position than in that position. So overall, the, the, um, the vibrations would average out, right? So what are the three things that need to happen for this, uh, these cross sections, for these angular distribution of the photoelectrons to come out with these asymmetric patterns? First thing that needs to happen is that that photoelectron needs to be sensitive to the uh, position of these atoms. And that's, that's reasonable. That, that will happen all the time. That it is sensitive. But that's not the point there. The, the thing is that it needs a process that will retain the memory of that symmetry, right? The R shape decay is that process, okay? So that happens in a fragment of the time that it takes the molecule to actually vibrate. So that's how the, the molecule, the, the first photoelectron, actually retains the memory. Third thing that needs to happen is that this molecule needs to dissociate promptly and, and, and directly because otherwise, if we give that uh, molecule time to rotate and tumble and vibrate, well, well, then it will certainly lose that information. So the third step of our calculation was to find out that this, to, to prove our theory, uh, or, or our hypotheses really, is to see if this state actually existed. And so we did, and we found uh, a three um, singlet pi state, this one here, that is directly downhill. And so this, this proves that at least that third condition could be met. Okay, these are some equations. There's many details here. I'm not going to go into them. The only thing uh, that I'm going to point out here is that when we include vibrational motion, it's important to include only half of the vibrational mode. If we include the full vibrational mode, we see no asymmetry at all, right? And see, these are some of the, these calculations that we did. All right, how, do these, how does this compare with experiment? Well, here we have... Um, the experimental measurements, these are these red dots again, right? And we have two other curves. We have a blue curve, which are calculations done with the molecule at its equilibrium geometry. That means when the carbon is perfectly centered between the two oxygens. And we have this black curve here, which is um, the, the calculations we did when we, um, when we average in, when we include half a vibrational mode and the bending mode, okay? So those are there. The symmetric stretch mode were, had negligible results, so, so they're not even in there. They, they practically did not contribute much at all, right? So what, what can we conclude of this? Well, we can, we can see that this culture, this experiment, is pretty much a, we use that as a reaction microscope pretty much, right? Now that we can look at these reactions, at these processes faster than they can vibrate, we can look at these at a time scale so short that we can see a world that is no longer symmetric. So what have we learned? Well, now that we can, that now that we can look inside molecules faster than they can vibrate, we can see those instantaneous symmetries that, at a longer time scale, average out to make the world a symmetric world, the world that we ordinarily see. And this example I picked, the carbon dioxide example, is not the only one. I mean, there are many examples now, nowadays in literature. This is an N2 molecule. And so you can't imagine the molecule even more symmetric than this, right? So what happens here is that if we have, and these, these are, are angular distributions of the O'Shea electron instead of the photoelectron, but the same thing applies for, for either electron. If we pull out, um, an electron that's in this, these delocalized uh, molecular or orbitals, what we get, and this is a calculation, a, perfect, a perfectly symmetric pattern here. However, if that is um, electron is pulled out closer from one of, from, from a closer than a, 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 one of these a nitrogen atoms, instead, we get a pattern that is asymmetric, right? And these calculations were later confirmed uh, by experiments. Once they could set the conditions, uh, so that they can actually um, do these experiments. And, and that has to, there's a trick in that that, that has to do with being able to catch all fragments and coincidence, and that's exactly what uh, cultures can do. So, this is the last uh, slide of the talk. Uh, I've uh, deliberately picked examples where it was the internal clock, clock that O'Shea decay 
that, um, that allowed us to see those instantaneous symmetries. But uh, a revolution is underway, which um, in, in, I'm talking about the earth of physics, which um, is called ultra-fast science. And that has to do with our, it, this has been launched by our ability to perform ever shorter uh, laser pulses. So uh, what you see here is a timeline. And this timeline uh, shows our, uh, our ability to make measurements that are uh, shorter and shorter in time scales, at, at shorter time scales, and of objects that move within those time scales. For instance, a, a, a fly that will, that will move its wings in a millisecond. But if we focus on molecules again, and we look at the time scales of rotation, vibrational, vibration, and electronic excitation of a molecule, we'll see that that goes from about 10 to the negative 12 seconds of picosecond all the way to a few hundred attoseconds, 10 to the negative 18 seconds. That spans six orders of magnitude, right? In uh, 1999, uh, Ahmed C. Whale won the Nobel Prize for pioneering femtochemistry. And femtochemistry, what he did is he studied uh, chemical reactions in the time scales of femtoseconds, uh, 10 to the uh, negative 15 seconds. And, um, but in the years that followed, in the last 10 years or so, we've been able to make a laser pulses in the time scales of attoseconds. And it is now possible to uh, measure the oscillations within a femtosecond pulse. So this, this pulse is a femtosecond time scale, so these oscillations are attosecond oscillations. But most importantly, it is now, uh, it is now possible to measure um, to make measurements in time scales that are commensurate to the motion of electrons in uh, chemical bonds, right? And uh, nowadays, phenomena such as these instantaneous symmetries are being observed routinely, and that is what most of this article by Ferenc Krauss and his collaborators is about. So this brings me back to our original question, the original question about the evolution of scientific thought. From what I can see, from what, what I can see here, there are experiments, experiments such as these, that are changing our perspective, and they're changing our view of the world. A world that was symmetric, now we are regarding as non-symmetric. For the past 60 years or so, we have been teaching our students a penalty based on symmetry, but we're now reaching a new understanding. So the question remains is whether uh, this view of the world is uh, is an experiment like this may perhaps lead to a, a, a irreversible uh, evolution of our perspective of the world. Perhaps in 20 or 50 years from now, we will be teaching our students based on dynamics and how much so on symmetries. So um, in that sense, maybe, perhaps, uh, the evolution of, a scientific, of scientific thought may not be so different from the evolution of animals, of course, with its, even though, of course, there is truth and falsity in science, and there is no, no such thing in animals. Thank you so much.